This is a genre-defying classic. Everybody should go out of their way to purchase this because it's going to redefine the way that people see live records from here on out. I think that the thing that you pe people usually tell me is, well, this is the heaviest album that we've ever made. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot to say that. Yeah, it's the heaviest record I ever made. <laughs>I know it's been a minute, but we are back. And what better way to return to creating content for you than by showing you this interview that I did just a couple of days ago with the one and only Devin Townsend. Now, I have interviewed Devin before, and he is by far one of my most uh, favorite people to, to just talk to and to interview because not only is he an extremely talented musician, but he is also a, just a very fun and interesting person to talk to. So I am sure that you're going to enjoy this interview. Now, you're going to notice that within the first four or five minutes of the interview, there are some issues uh, with his camera and my camera, but all of that gets solved about five minutes in, so everything should be fine. And in any case, the audio, of course, works completely fine, and we are going to have a transcript of the interview plus the subtitles here on the video itself. Um, we have some pretty big things coming out relatively soon. Uh, it's a big project that I have been working with um, sorry, I have been working on for the better part of a year. So uh, I hope that we will be able to release it soon. Uh, but in any case, until then, without further ado, enjoy this great interview uh, with this great musician, Devin Townsend. And I hope to see you again very, very soon here. So take care. So Devin, first of all, uh, it's really nice to see you again. Every time I interview you, I get many more views than usual. So it does seem to be that you are a, a, a very uh, attractive and interesting uh, person for the for the fans. Um, I'm flattering. Thanks, buddy. No, I, I really I really mean it. And I think that it is one of the things that are interesting about you as a musician, because um, despite the fact that you are heavily associated with musical talent, and by that I mean your, your ability as a guitar player and as a composer, I think that many fans have connected a lot with you also in regards to your lyrics or about the message that you present to the to the fans in your music that many of them perceive as extremely empowering. So I can really understand where that attention, that interest, and that, for lack of a better word, that love from your fans really comes from. It's a pleasure to to play music and try to represent something that I think helps rather than hinders. So, you know, I'm appreciative of of anybody who cares to listen to it for sure, man. I was looking at your uh, tour schedule earlier today and it's you've been pretty much touring almost nonstop since February. I think only May you took off completely, but it has been really a bunch of, of, of dates uh, one after the other. How has it been for you considering that for such a long time, you know, we were closed down. I think that a big part of my uh, creative process lately has been trying to make changes within my life that reflect where I want to go, as opposed to where I've been over and over and over again for so many years. And coming back after the pandemic, it was in um, not only my best interest, but in the interest of, of, of the goals of what I've been trying to achieve musically to get out there and tour again. But by doing so, I recognize that uh, uh, I need to sort of change that in a way. And it's not like I dislike touring. It's not like I dislike playing for people. But when I first started making records, I had such a, an opportunity to focus on the material because I wasn't pulled in different directions. I wasn't touring. I wasn't doing podcasts. I wasn't doing all these things. And I think that the benefit of that back then is I could really hone in on what it was that I was trying to achieve creatively. And I've got a plan for a project uh, in 2025 called The Moth that I really hope to be able to uh, sort of revert back to that sort of focus. And in order to do so, I need to come off the road a bit. And uh, it's not like I won't be back out again. But I just really would like to see what would happen if at this age I was able to uh, put that same degree of focus into the work that I haven't been able to do for 20 some odd years, right? But it's been, you know, touring in general is, it's cool, man. I've been doing it for so long that it's just, you just have to remember how to take a shit in a truck stop. That's like the, that's like, <laughs> it seems like those are the type of things that 
are much more difficult than any of the performance stuff is being around 12 of your buddies an inch and a half from each other in your underwear for six weeks and then trying to remember how to function within that capacity is where the work is. I think that one of the most disappointing experiences of my life was the first time that I did a, an interview inside of a, a tour bus. Oh, and yeah. that it looked nothing like what I had been led to believe a tour oh, yeah. bus looked like. So there were, I, I expected, Honestly, in hindsight, like just with, with a, just a small amount of rationality, you realize, I don't know what the fuck I was expecting. It's not like you can put a jacuzzi well, I, in there. But I, I, I had bon very Jovi. high, like, modley crew level expectations. That's it. <laughs> I blame Bon Jovi for their videos of, of, of uh, letting us think that it was more romantic than it is. But that being said, it's like I'm, I'm very grateful to do it. It's not that it's... Uh, um, and after years of touring in vans and, and ice cream trucks and things like that, uh, you know, being in a bus just straight up is, is, is just so much, it's so much more luxurious than much of the touring that I've done in my life. So I'm not necessarily complaining about it, but it is a skill set. You have to learn, you have to learn how to navigate the, uh, the chaos that is, uh, the travel aspect of it. I think Alice Cooper put it well, where he says, your job is not playing shows. That's, that's what you get to do for, for fun. Your job is traveling. <laughs> you, you mentioned two things that I want to pay attention to. One of them is whether at this age, you could put this level of attention on a project in regards to the moth. And the second is, of course, this short touring hiatus or a sabbatical, however you want to call it, that you would take. Uh, on the first point, the issue of your age, um, do you feel that aging is so there, there's obviously the issue of physical recovery when you perform and you have to be up, you know, two hours, I, I get that part. But in addition to the physical um, <laughs> deterioration that we all experience as, as the years go by, has age in any other way affected you as a musician? Yeah, very much. I mean, I think a lot of what makes music vital when you're younger is the fact that you're referencing things that have happened to you for the first time, right? So maybe the first, your first love or you lose your virginity or a person close to you passes away and you experience death for the first time or, or any number of things. And, and as a result of that, your, your work and everything that uh, comes out of those experiences become a lot more vital, I think. Um, I've, I'm, I'm of the mindset that music is 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 a document of the experience of being alive like and really that's it and so when you are referencing things that are so new it has an energy behind it that you simply don't have as you get older because there's not as many first experiences now right there's not as many and well there are of course but they're not the ones that are as ubiquitous it's not the ones that everybody has it becomes a lot more uh, compartmentalized as you get older i believe and as such your your reference points for writing become a lot more narrow uh when i started the conceptual aspects of what i was drawing from were really wide swaths it's like this is about love this is about death this is about truth this is about you know uh regret or whatever they were like very big concepts but you can only mine those for so long before you either a start to repeat yourself or b just become so um idiosyncratic about it that you're not reaching anybody you know you're not you're not able to sort of reference something that that a, a lot of people are going to be able to participate in and so now that i'm older the work that i i feel is 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 some of the most challenging parts of the of the writing process is referencing my own experience but in a way that has enough um throw that it can apply to other experiences so so with that, um, where I'm at now with with the future writing is is really in a in a, in a strategy phase, 
or I'm having to sort of look at what's happened over the past couple of years, what my objectives are moving forward, where my family's at, where my friends are at, where the industry's at, and then draw some conclusions about that creatively for myself that aren't so individual that no one can relate, you know? And that's, that's, that's a hard thing to do as you get older. Again, when you're younger, I think you're in a lot of ways on the same page with a lot of the people, you know, everybody's going through similar things, but at 51, man, it's like a lot more idiosyncratic. And, and um, I feel like the nature of the work is meant to communicate to people. So learning how to take those idiosyncratic experiences and then have them more um, of a universal experience is is much more nuanced than it has been in the past and that's why it probably is going to take more time now and from that perspective is success as the one that you have had somehow counterproductive to creativity because for example a couple of the bands that i really like are let's say nine inch nails or metallica in the case of nine inch nails a lot of the music deals with alienation and isolation and the kind of things that are not really <laughs> special, like, I, no longer apply to you when you have won a couple of Oscars uh, well, for this making is a soundtrack, great, right? Great, great, great question, great point. And one that I think about often, and, and the answer is, is yes, I agree. It's, it makes it much more difficult, but it's not in the same way. You know, I think that, well, maybe it is because you look at Metallica, for example, and maybe the foundation of their work had something to do with being alienated or, or any number of, of adjectives and the same thing with Nine Inch Nails, you know, like when they, when Pretty Hate Machine came out, uh, so much of it was due to a broken heart or what have you. And as that heals and you start to generate income and, and you change as a person, how do you service the fan base that at one time was interested in you because of something that no longer exists, right? For me, the, the way that success is an impediment to my process is, the foundation of my process, unlike theirs, where it was maybe about alienation or whatever, the foundation of my process is about trying to document a process of self-discovery. And so much of that happens internally. And if your reference point for your creativity is now including a whole lot of people and a whole lot of obligation and a whole lot of maybe expectation it's much more tempting to interpret your experience as a human being as being different than it actually is. You know, so it's like the process of, of writing now includes so much trying to call myself on things that I think I'm just full of shit about. And you, 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 you only have that reference point in, in terms of personal failures, I think, uh, more so than the successes. And so I'm fortunate that I'm surrounded by so many people that I've been surrounded by for so many years uh, that my music is a sideline for my relationship with them. So if I start acting in ways that are um, entitled or, or uh, in line with what somebody would assume a person with success, how they would act, they're going to call me on it really quickly. And and they have, right? And through those moments, that's how I find that I'm able to maintain my my perception on on my own um, uh, process of self discovery. And I think the other thing that's that's uh, important to note in terms of 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 that is it's okay if it changes. It's okay if the aesthetic changes. It's okay if the overarching uh, image of what it is that you're trying to represent changes as long as it's still rooted in an authentic experience. And I think that that's an avenue that I can take to, to continue trying to uh, stick to my guns when it comes to my original objective while still experiencing the changes that come from more exposure. It's like it's okay to sing about different things if the foundation of it is still authenticity, because I think that's what people pick up on more than anything else. And maybe it's the same with other bands too. Maybe it's the same with a lot of these bands that have had wild success, like far and beyond anything that I will ever experience. Maybe as long as they're still authentic to 
that process, then people will still resonate with it. That, that is very interesting because uh, this issue that you mentioned of starting to create music that becomes extremely idiosyncratic precisely because you are so separate from everything else is something that I've been thinking a, 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 about a lot uh, since I saw James Hetfield at a festival and I remember that he was walking and he was surrounded by like a lot of cops and then surrounded by a lot of security guards so that you, you realize that the experience that some musicians at that level start to live through is completely alien to 99.999% of the, of the planet. So that creating something that people can relate to becomes considerably more challenging. 100%, 100%. But I think that the avenue and, and maybe the workload for, for people who unfortunately find themselves in that scenario is if you can remain authentic to your person, even as it changes, people may not relate to it, people may not um, even appreciate it. But I think that's your only option. Otherwise, the people who were emotionally invested in the work from the beginning are going to be able to see through it. If you just try to replicate, you know, if Metallica, or James Hetfield is a multi multi hundred time over millionaire with all the problems and all the things that go along with that try to replicate you know ride the lightning or something the true fans the people that put him in that position are going to be the first to say oh i don't believe you and so the fortunate part of that is that there there remains an option for for people in that position and that is okay how do i write about this how do i write about this scenario with people around me and and all of this and and then I think you're at a point where you, you, you choose to be either an artist or, or, a, or, or a commercial enterprise. Because as a commercial enterprise, you can continue saying, okay, well, what are the components that made this successful? And how can we repackage that in a way that keeps this brand moving? Or you write about something that's so idiosyncratic that the majority of your audience is just like, I don't get it, man. Right? On, 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 on still on the, the topic of how your creativity is affected through these events. I remember, and I am sorry to, to repeat the issue of Nine Inch Nails, a few years ago, um, I remember reading an interview perhaps with Trent Reznor, the singer and founder of Nine Inch Nails, in which he mentioned that as he got clean, because he had a many abuse, uh, drug abuse problems and a lot of depression, and it was, it was pretty rough, that as he got yeah. clean and he got a wife and he got kids and his, his life started to work, um, he felt that there was some resentment from fans who, in a way, wanted him to continue being this angsty, utterly fucked up person because he can create the music that I want him to create and he is an avatar of my own problems. So that if right. he gets clean, that avatar character no longer applies. Um, since you have gone through something similar in regards to yeah. substance abuse and, and, and mental sure. health issues, yeah. How, how do you feel that? Well, you have a choice to make as an artist at that point, you know, um, and the choice is yours alone. And one side of that choice comes with alienation from the people that put you in a position of, of privilege. And that can go one of several ways, you know, it could, it could go better. You could find yourself in a position where you're, you've hit a new plateau that wouldn't have existed and it's a new group of people, or it could derail it entirely. Um, and then the other side is that you're reliant on the attention that being an avatar and a projection of what people's um, needs for uh, expressing that sort of uh, toxicity requires. But I think at that part, you become, you play the martyr. And uh, I think that that choice is actually a very sad one. So a fundamental part of the artistic process, I think, is you're constantly being confronted with very difficult um, choices. I mean, that's the same with any job. But on an artistic level, if you have recognized that as I did, the, the process of making music in the past that was rooted in substance or, or, or dysfunction was a path to get to the place where that is uh, no longer part of my life, then 
you have to respect it, but you also have to accept the fact that 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 was you, and you have to make peace with that too. Um, and part of making peace with that is just is is accepting that there's some people that just aren't going to like it, and that's as simple as that. There's people that might be angry, there's people that might be upset or hurt by it, but the role of being an artist is you've elected yourself in a lot of ways to be the person that is confronted with these choices. And as a result, you just have to make it, man. You have to choose whether or not you're going to be a martyr and, and do the things that people expect of you that are incongruent with the personal growth that you've made, or you, you just hold your nose and follow your path and hope that, uh, you know, whatever karmically or, or, or on some sort of personal level, the choices that you've made are, are the ones that are in line with your, with your purpose. And that's it. Let's talk a little bit about this two year or a couple of years break that you need to create the, the moth. Yeah. Um, why do you think that is necessary? Because I've changed on, uh, as we all probably have on a fundamental level over the past of a few years with the pandemic and everything. And in order for all these disparate pieces of experiences to coagulate into an identity that I can draw from accurately, I need silence and space. It's as simple as that. It's we can keep grinding at the wheel and, and putting out um, material without any sort of um, reflection. And I've been doing that for years because there hasn't been these dramatic shifts. There's been shifts, of course, throughout the past 10 years, you know, kids getting older or whatever, but there hasn't been a fundamental shift in the ways that the pandemic has clearly brought about uh, in society and, and personally. And I feel maybe it's a failing on the, the part of my ability to perceive my environment, or maybe it's just what it is. But if I don't have time and space to let that coagulate into an identity that I can very clearly articulate creatively, um, it's not going to be right. And it's just going to be awkward. And I've always wanted to make a symphony. I've always wanted to make, uh, you know, an opera and, uh, and the, just the costs of doing it are so prohibitive that, if I choose to do it, which I, I believe I have, which I know I have, I got to be damn sure that what I'm, the perspective that I'm coming at it from is in line with, with my, my truth, right? My realizations and, and all of these things, just, it takes time. And I haven't had any time for many years by my own hand, just like, record, tour, record, tour, record, tour, record, tour, you know what I mean? It's just like endless. And so when I finally did get a chance to stop, two things came to the front. One, I don't want to stop making music. I love it. There's some people I know that just like, oh, I realize that I don't want to make music anymore. So a God smack say that, you know, we don't want to write music anymore. And that's maybe what their realization was during it. But, but for me, it's not an option. It's not like I can turn it off. It's like, it's what I do. It's my thing. You know, you and should read, uh, if I may, you should read an, uh, an essay that George Orwell wrote. Uh, it's called Why I Write. And mm -hmm. there he basically talks about how you should write if you feel that there is this thing inside of you that just needs to come out. It is not a I'm choice. Sure. It is not that you're nope. sitting down to choose to write. Nope. You have to do it. But at the same, in the same breath, uh, you have to honor that. And part of honoring that is is doing the legwork to understand your connection to it. And this is my opinion, of course, right? But it's like, if you're, if you're, and as I have in the past, blindly um, cruising through a creative process, you know, where you're high all the time, or you're drunk all the time, or you're engaged with a lot of things that, that allow you to sort of unconsciously participate in your, in your creative muse, then I think that's a different process. And I don't think there's anything necessarily right or wrong about that. It's just, it's different. But if you've got to the point where you're a lot more clear about who you are and what your objectives may or may not be, um, to honor that requires the time and space. And 
the compulsion that you spoke of with like Orwell's essay is clearly within me. Like I've tried on several occasions to stop and it's like, you know, it's hubris, man. It's like, it, it's the assumption of me thinking, oh, I can just stop is that, um, is that it's a hobby rather than a personality. <laughs> you know, it's like, I just, I think music, that's how I interpret my environment. And in the past, I spent a lot of emotional energy trying to um, rationalize that, whether or not it was uh, trying to identify what the, what the, what the, the, the compulsion was, or to try and maybe retroactively um, fix what I maybe viewed as a dysfunction within myself that manifested as a need to create something. Maybe it was because I needed it for validation. Maybe I needed it for this or that or the other thing. But I, 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 I feel now that that's also uh, a lot of hubris just to try and um, get to the root of something that is intangible. And what I feel is now the most important thing is to not um, think about it but also make the channel that allows it to actualize um, as clear as it can be, whether or not that's through balance on a, on a psychological level or, or um, you know, maintaining uh, your personal, physical, mental health, whatever. At that point, when the music begins to come out, it's a direct reflection of, of a path that you've chosen that is one that you can back. And again, I feel that it's really, um, it's really childish of me to try and uh, rationalize the process. It's like beyond me, it's beyond you, it's beyond all of us, it's beyond Orwell, it's beyond anybody. It's like the collective unconscious is, is the wellspring of, of artistic motivation and, and to, to participate in it is, is a joy, ultimately. So. That's where I'm at. In, in regards to the moth, you said that you have always wanted to write an opera. So, what what do you mean? What do we? What are we talking about when we say opera in regards to the moth? Like Wagnerian opera or Tommy or opera the Who or Avantasia rock opera? Yeah. <laughs> opera in the sense that it's it's a narrative that's driven by the music rather than um, by the story. So, uh, the the nature of, of what it is that I feel compelled to write this thing about is, you know, it's the hero's journey. It's the same archetypical uh, storyline that exists everywhere, right? But that's just a vehicle for me to illustrate those eight character archetypes with music. And I found that my connection to music has always been very visual. So when I'm writing about something or when I'm writing about a concept or a, or a, a theme or even a name, it's got a very identifiable color and shape and aesthetic to me. It's synesthesia, I suppose. And, and, and so it's always seemed like part of my trip eventually to illustrate a story with music. And anytime I've been asked to do it before, like, like we'd like you to score a film or we'd like, I just, unless I have complete control over it, I don't care about it. And that's, you know, I, a lot of times why I don't solicit myself for work like that is because I don't want to come across like that tendency is belligerent. Like, oh, I can't work with anybody. It has to be my own vision. I'm just like, I know that's the case. So I don't seek it. I don't ask people. And then all of a sudden put my hand against my forehead and say, I'm an artist or whatever. So I feel the best way for me to, to do this thing that seems clearly in my line of sight is just to do it myself, write a story, make it something that I can fill in the blanks, color it in with something that um, is thematically in some ways, the culmination of, of what I've been working on for all these years and just fucking do it. That's it. Like there's really, that's it. It really doesn't sound like you, you would be compatible with making soundtracks to be honest, because 
just recently I read this, I think it was Atticus Ross and Fred Ress were talking about the soundtrack that they did for Bird Box. And they said it was basically a waste of time. You watch the movie, you can barely hear it. People, the, 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 the mixer in the end doesn't prioritize the music. So it was a waste of time. So that I can imagine that you would just start just punching the TV if you watch something that you scored that is not edited yes. in a way that satisfies you. Yes, absolutely. And life's so short, man. It's like, what would be your reason for doing that other than a big paycheck and the attention that comes from it? Which, you know, both both those things, there's there's benefits to it in terms of your maybe long-term goal as a as a creative. But but if you're not if you're able to pay your rent and you're not seeking fame as a primary motivator for your work then why the fuck would you do it like it doesn't make any sense to have like a committee of people tell you that you know one part doesn't sound zombie-ish or something it's like i i just it's it seems awful and so so for me my lack of compatibility with others when it comes to um a creative endeavor like that is actually limited only to having like a committee uh that i, I actually did a 14 episodes of a children's show for BBC in in the UK where I just did children's music and fortunately the, the producer and the and the and the the program director for that were really kind people and they were really good people and they appreciated what I do but it was still a nightmare man for to have them go through and say this part isn't this this part isn't this and I so you know I, I feel mercifully I was held by the hand for that one experience with scoring something enough that at the end of it i was able to even have a dialogue with them and say god i've never i've never should do this again and they laughingly agreed they're like you know we like you we think your work's good but yeah you should not be doing this <laughs> <laughs> but so, how how did you end up in a children's cartoon or movie or whatever of all things well i think you know, maybe the nature of what I do, depending on which avenue you've been introduced to it, you're going to have a different, like, I mean, I've done, I just put out eight records for sleep music, and I've done, you know, I've done. I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, it just came out on Monday. It's called Dream Peace. And, uh, but I've also done industrial death metal, and I've done orchestral, and I've done country music, and I've done, you know, symphonic, epic rock and whatever and and because it's all been marketed in a in a unique way people come into each one of those avenues with the perception of what i do as being like that so the people that remember me doing alien from strapping on lad if they hear me doing sleep music or new age ambient music they're going to be confused by it and vice versa like the people from the bbc who came into the work by hearing a new age ambient music album that I did called Ghost, which had harps and flutes and acoustic guitar. They were like, oh, this guy's great. This would be great for a kid's show. And then when they found out that I did brutal industrial death metal, they were just like, oh my God, <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think they, the reason why I got that gig is because the first thing they heard was the quiet stuff, right? Hey, when we spoke during the pandemic, I remember that you were- I remember too, yeah. Uh, like uh, I appreciate it, but I mean that yeah, yeah. Uh, I I remember that you mentioned something that that I could relate to and that many people could as well, which is this struggling a little bit with 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 mental health while being in in isolation. This was in September of 2020 or something, so there was still plenty to go. Um, I teach in a university, and one of the things that I've noticed with students, for example, who spend these two years of isolation and suddenly they need to come to class psychologically things are not the same as uh, it is difficult to suddenly go from i don't need to deal with anybody's bullshit to i need to deal with everybody's bullshit um how has that shift been for you this reintegration of devon townsend into polite society <laughs> it's been it's been violent because it was hand in hand with a lot of things on a personal level like with my family and with you know, having to leave where we lived for 15 years and, and lots of that renovating and, and all these things that, that went along with it were, were so draining 
on a psychological level that compounded by a pandemic, I've spent the past two years just recalibrating. And now, so I've been touring, as you had said, for, for a lot of time over the past year. And I find that the best way for me to navigate the emotional demands of not only a changing industry, uh, the projection, both positive and negative from an audience, having to be in constant contact with other adult human beings 24 hours a day for eight weeks at a time, where I've very meticulously structured my life to be the opposite of that. <laughs> I, I can absolutely understand that. <laughs> but it's, it's, I think part of the job description is like the people that are able to do it are the ones that are going to be able to continue. And learning how to do it is um, a skill set. And the way that I maintain that skill set is just trying to foster uh, psychological balance in a number of ways, meditation, exercise, diet, you know, sleep as, as much of a fun free lifestyle as that sounds like uh, it's a path through it. And, you know, we had some trauma uh, over the past week out here and had that not been in place, I think it would have been much more difficult. You mean within and, the yeah. tour structure? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. And, uh, you know, in order to be there for, for your friends and your family and your work, um, I think now more than ever, uh, fostering internal self-balance is essential. Maybe that's another thing that they faked us into thinking when we were talking about Bon Jovi and Motley Crue on the tour bus is that it's all, it's all sex, drugs, and rock and roll, right? But maybe at the time there was an industry that enabled that, but now that is so far gone that although that those sorts of activities still exist, they're an impediment to, to being able to navigate a lot of this. But, but that is, uh, I, well, I understand that if I was, uh, you know, 20 year old kid, um, on tour, I would want the Motley Crew experience probably. I do think that it is good that we are kind of moving past that because I think that oh, it, it, it oh, was God. a space for largely the abuse of women. So I-, I well, there's that. 100%. So I, I, I thought that it was quite a, uh, so, I, I, so I can understand as a, you know, as a male and as a person who was a kid once, who's like, man, just being in a tour and just boning all all, all day is like, yeah, that's <laughs> fucking great. But when you, when you look a little bit into it, you think, yeah, maybe th there are some issues that make it a little bit iffy. Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you the thing that hammers at home more than anything else is like, I was fortunate to come up in the industry starting in 1991. So it was right after that whole era existed we were actually still on the tail end of it to be fair but um but i'm friends or at least acquaintances with a, a number of people that were in that thing you know these kind of 80s rock stars i guess and a lot of them are psychologically really um broken now because it's like you i think that you go through these experiences as as kids and you think that it's like, um, you know, in the moment, it's, 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 you know, live for the day kind of thing. But I think the long term ramifications of any decision are, um, are what they are. And, and, you know, dealing with the ramifications of sleeping with a 1000 people or something, I think, you know, I think that would psychologically be really intense. It is. I, I mean, I, that's why I decided to draw a line at 950. That's what I said. Not one <laughs> more. We need to have a limit on this shit. Otherwise, you know what, man? it's too much. Kudos to your self-control. That's that's <laughs> admirable. That's admirable. Yeah, I mean, you you gotta you gotta place limits. You know, it's part of my system. You know what, man? You're a good man. Just to 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 make the the label happy. Um, <laughs> Tell me a little bit about this devolution series of albums, because I, I didn't know that there was a title to the to the two previous live albums and to this one. But yes, it's devolution series. I think I read somewhere that it was more of a, a label name. What it is, is uh, there's a lot of things that I have on the sideline and it acts as a like these minor level releases 
that allow me to sort of stay present in the in the public sphere while I'm trying to figure out what's next. <laughs> that is an extremely um, exhausting part of the music business now that we have since we have created this system in which attention is really what we are trying to to get. Uh, yeah. that in order to get that attention, you do need to have a lot of things that for many musicians and many artists seem very alien to them. So you need well, to yeah. have a constant presence in social media and make all that bullshit. Yeah, and they're contentious as well. Like there's a lot of people in the in the in the same audience that allowed you to get to the point where you can do these things that don't want to have a reissue of a record they already got with just a different picture on the cover or they don't want to have um, you know, some some novelty pencil case with your logo on it or whatever it is and coffee or beer or whatever it is, right? But I think for me, um, two things. One, I, I try to I try to be as involved with each one of these releases as I can be. So so it's still something that passes my litmus test of whether or not it's worth putting out. And they are. And then on the other side, I think it's a I think it's a, a give and take with an audience that has been very supportive, forgiving, and um, and open to what it takes in 2023 for people to continue making things. So I find a lot of people will support these releases and these products that I put out less because they really want it, and more because it's obvious that. Um, in 2023, in order for an artist to continue, they need some degree of income, you know? So um, I put out these devolution things with Inside Out Records, where there's Live at Leeds, there was a Galactic Quarantine, and there's Live in America. And they're all, you know, I put a lot of effort into each one of them. They're not like a main release. It's not something that I'm like, here's my new record or, or what have you. But they're they're cool. And for people who really enjoy the work perhaps it'll hold some interest for them and that's the extent of it it's not it's not meant to um reinvent the wheel it's not meant to uh you know i'm awful at selling myself in the first place but yeah i was gonna I, tell you that no this is yeah. this is fantastic you should put this yeah. in the press release i mean it's not the main I, album I but you know whatever check it out <laughs> well i mean what are you, if you're trying to if you're trying to trade in authenticity man like what are you gonna do this is a genre defined classic. Everybody should go out of their way to purchase this because it's going to redefine the way that people see live records from here on out. I think that the Actually, thing that you people usually tell me is, well, this is the heaviest album that we've ever made. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot to say that. That's yeah, the heaviest record I ever made. <laughs> I mean, I think the thing with the with this Devolution release that is interesting, and I, I say this legitimately, is it was the last tour prior to the pandemic and it was actually the one that got that got cancelled and we had to go home in the middle of it but the objective for that tour was i took a bunch of disparate musicians who didn't play the type of music that i typically do and then we learned the songs on stage while people yelled them out from the audience and we didn't have click tracks and we didn't and a lot of the songs the drummer didn't know and so uh so how i'm selling the record now is it's like it's the songs that you may know and like from me, but not played right. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is all stuff that needs to go in the press kit. I am surprised that they're not there yeah. already. Um, it's actually okay, man. It's cool. Yeah, you know, uh, over a year ago, uh, on the last episode that you did of your podcast, you uh, were, you did it about NFTs with uh, someone from Avenge Sevenfold, who. Yeah. Um, has been proven wrong, I am guessing, because <laughs> the whole thing went to shit very quickly. Um, yeah, yeah. Was I, so it's not a question about NFTs or anything like that uh, in regards to the market, but rather, did people approach you to try to create them? Because for a little oh, yeah. bit, there was this, yeah. everyone was trying to create something. Well, this, is my, this was my objective with getting him on the podcast and also my things with it because you know industry clamors to try and make money everybody's like oh, we got to do nfts of you know 700 versions of your butthole or something that we've got numbered that we put up online and so what i wanted to do more so than say yes or no to it was just put it out to the audience and say well, what do you think of this and unequivocally people were just like oh i hate it and but then matt from avenged contacted me and he says 
if you want to talk about it in a public sphere, this is what we're doing as a band. And so I had him on there, but I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. So I just let him talk. It's like, you tell me what you think is cool about it. And I just listened basically. But the reaction to that was with such vitriol that. Oh, that, really? People reacted badly? Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. People, I, I, I didn't, I didn't follow the reactions. I, I did get the impression <laughs> that what you wanted was, I don't know anything about this. And this is a dude who seems to like them and they're making totally. them and sell me, tell me that it's the way to go. Um, uh, but, but it did, uh, like all the other NFTs, it went to shit. Don't put a lot of money on a JPEG. Uh, sorry, on the link to a JPEG. It is not a fantastic business decision for most people. Well, I mean, my my track record shows that I, I didn't go down that that route. So so whether or not I, I fundamentally understood or agreed with what he was saying, my decision was clear that I kept making my things. And but but at the same time, like this thing I put out on Monday is called Dream Peace and it's like on Spotify and it's just constant ambient records that I've been I like I make it all the time. I put out eight records on Monday of ambient music. And it's one of my favorite things in the world to do. But I again I'm not looking to sell it to people. I just really love doing it and it really benefits that's one that I, I, I can do a press release for well. I can say I love making it because I listen to it while I'm trying to sleep. In the morning, I've got a little place set up where I drink my coffee and I make ambient music and I have a loop all day so that when I go to work at night, I can surprise myself by whatever loop um, had been uh, created in the morning. And then I just assemble it into these um, these sort of bespoke pieces of, of work that function in a practical level for either meditation or, or, or sleep music or, you know, putting kids to sleep or whatever. And, and that's a passion project. I love that, man. And, and to have the opportunity to, to do that digitally and with YouTube and websites and Deezer and all these things is one of those upsides of, of the digital revolution. And I really do appreciate the fact that I can put things up without having to have the pomp and circumstance that comes with a release, right? Where, well, we need six months to set it up and, you know, we're going to have to do a promo tour of you saying that's the heaviest record you've ever made and all this sort of thing, right? On this issue of authenticity, I think that it is so noticeable when it comes to trying to sell products that are so outside of the, let's call it brand that you've built around yourself. Sure. Again, in the topic of NFTs, I remember when Aussie announced that they were going to release ones. And it says that I asked Sharon for an NFT and then I decided to create my own. This dialogue never fucking happened. We all no, know that this never, there wasn't a moment in which Aussie was just, you know, managing to be coherent and say, man, I really want an NFT. Like this is- Well, this, I've, been, I've been proposed on a number of occasions from people that I've worked with to put these fictional scenarios of how we met together. And it's so full of shit that it just it's just so stupid dude and it's what do um, you mean of how we met oh it's yeah i'll leave it at that but it's like uh you know like you'll work with somebody like well we got to put out a thing this is how we met and this is you know the oh scenario. like uh, okay all right now i understand like what you mean story like yeah. you know the you know the uh origin story of a fucking project or something right but um but uh what I think is 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 interesting about that is the idea that I think for many years, and you may agree or disagree, but the industry has functioned under the assumption that their audience is dumber than them. But yes. I think it's proving. But I think it's proving that in a lot of ways it's exactly the opposite. And it's like if you're, if you if you feel that by uh, trying to pull the wool over people's eyes by you know, thinking that your audience is too stupid to know that Ozzy and Sharon are not going to have a conversation about NFTs, then that's on you, right? Well, I remember uh, I, the, 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 the quote that I'm going to say was restricted to the American public, but I think is broader than that in reality, which is nobody has ever lost money by um, assuming that the American public is dumber than it actually is. Uh, and it is true in the sense that you, the, 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 I, the, the court is in America, and I think that it, it goes beyond just the United States. Oh, it certainly course, applies yeah, to the Western course. world. Um, yeah, if you, if, you put a, if you autograph a piece of shit, somebody's going to buy it. So Yeah, but it's, are they the people that you want to buy it, right? Like my closest friends are actually 
all Americans. So it's like one of these things where I think about the generalizations of any um, demographic as being one thing or another. Those demogra- those, those I really generalizations- didn't mean just the, the, the United States. No, uh, Ameri- okay, cool. But I think that the generalizations exist depending on what it is that you're trying to do. Like, I think if you if you're looking for stupid people, man, you can find it in any place in the world. In any 100%. And I think that I think that uh, I think that for for me at this point, if I like on the last record, I had done this song um, that I felt really uncomfortable about because the producer and a bunch of other, quote unquote, famous people that. I was involved with her telling me, oh, this is a hit. This song is going to change your life. It's a hit. And I was like, oh, fuck, I don't know about that. And we had Nile Rogers play guitar on it. You know, he just offered to play guitar on it. It's like one of these crazy things. But because of a copyright issue with a sample on it, it didn't get released. And my first thought was complete relief. Because I thought, if you were audience such as it is is something that you choose to cultivate and maintain you're you're pretty aware that that the people that that are in your sphere right now are people that you enjoy playing for you know there's a limited amount of them for sure but but they're they seem smart and they seem cool and they seem in general, reasonably compassionate and, and intelligent. And, and it's like, and so that's a great audience to have. Say, for example, you fluked out and you made some song, you know, whatever, some stupid topic, you know, balloon animals or whatever it was. And then you, and you became wildly successful in this sphere of people that you have nothing in common with personally. But that is something or, or, that, that you dealt with before, I think. I, if I am not mistaken, I, I heard you say that maybe at the end of Strapping Young Lad or a little bit later that you realized that you were attracting the kind of people that you did not want to attract necessarily? Or am I misremembering? Well, it wasn't. It? Yeah, that's, that's, that's a way of putting it. But it wasn't that I, it wasn't that I disliked or at least disrespected that audience i just realized how much fundamentally i was ill-equipped to be a figurehead for it because so much of my uh, motivation to do that music was was due to like an unconscious uh, fear of confrontation that manifested as as well, i want to be angrier than everybody because then it will just keep everybody away from me and i'll never have to confront anything it's like it's like, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized, I'm like, well, you just never dealt with your anger. You never learned how to, how to articulate anger in a way that was separate from your fear of it. And so when I recognized that I was becoming um, famous for a topic that I started to believe I, I, I was, I didn't understand, or I was at least rooted in fear when it came to it. I thought, man, that's that's not going to work because I can't. Where do I go from there? And in the same way, if you release a song that becomes really popular with a, with a different demographic, again, not one that I disrespect. It's not a judgment call. It's just I don't relate. Then you're kind of you're stuck. So the old adage of I'd rather be unsuccessful than become successful at something that I'm not meant to be successful at is is something I'm very aware of. Devin, thank you so much for all the time that you've given me today. It has been a really you big too, pleasure. Brother. So anybody you who too, wants man. to see you until 2025 better do it this year, because after that, uh, you're going to be I'll gone. Be back. I'll be yeah, back. no, but gone for a couple of years at the very least while you prepare the moth. Well, it's funny. It's like those two years go by pretty quick. So I think that by the time these sort of interviews that I've been doing about it, run their course of circulation it'll probably be two years already so do you think that you're gonna do just to see the audience like do live streams again while you're off the because that that was really fun like i really enjoyed saying you are really you're a very fun performer to watch i think that that is (laughs) no it's just that there are some musicians who are very talented but they're not like 
fun to observe, if you know what I mean. <laughs> but you're like a fun you dude. No hair. To, yeah. You got no hair, man. Yeah, you, well, you make up a, for it. You make up for it. I built a thank you, man. I built a green screen <laughs> studio. Um, so the idea is yes to do live streams during the process of 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 writing and, and recording the moth. So the answer to that is is almost undeniably yes. Wonderful. Devin, once again, thank Thanks, you so man. much for your time. I hope you're gonna have a, a fantastic pleasure, have I'm same. sure we'll see each other again sometime, so take it easy.